this is going to be a challenging message, uh, not because of what I just said, but uh, for, uh, for other reasons. First, like I said, Apollo, what we're talking about is why we believe. And it's going to be challenging because, like I said, you're going to have to put your thinking caps on. It's going to be a little bit difficult to follow some of this stuff. And the other reason why is it's going to be challenging is because I'm going to be challenging you to ask yourself the question, why? Um, and why is a tough question? You know, sometimes our kids will ask the question, why? And they'll ask it again and again and again. And, you know, why should I do this? Clean your room, why? Well, you know, and then they, you keep, they keep asking this question, why, until you get to the point where you say, well, because I said so, you know? Uh, you just kind of get sick of the question. But why can be a tough question. It's a penetrating question. It kind of gets why, the question why, gets to the heart of the matter. And that's why the question could be so tough sometimes. So the question I'm going to challenge us to... Uh, today with is why do you believe what you believe? Not what do you believe, but why do you believe what you believe? That's a tough question. It's going to be a challenging one um, because it's one thing to believe. It's another thing to answer. Why do we believe what we believe? I want to read uh, a scripture from uh, the book of First Peter. First Peter is uh, really just a letter. We call it a book. And uh, this is from First Peter chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. So let's listen to what Peter has to say here. It says, Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Kind of like what we talked about last week when the, with the Beatitude. Even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared, Peter says, to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed by their slander. Would you pray with me? Lord, I, uh, I ask that you would just uh, guide us through this. And as we get through, we start asking these tough questions. God, I pray that we would all uh, be open and honest with our relationship with you. And God, I pray that you would just make yourself real to us, make yourself known to us. God, if we're, if we're going to know you, it's going to have to be from you. So God, we just, I just ask that you would um, be with this congregation as we walk through this series. Be with the families that are represented here. God, I pray that this would be a time of strengthening of faith, of uh, that you would be more real to us than you ever have been before. And God, I just ask this in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So what's Peter saying here in this passage uh, where he's uh, exhorting us? Well, first of all, he says what we said last week. If you're, if you're wronged, if someone wrongs you, continue to do right. It's, if someone wrongs you, it's not an excuse for you to say, well, I, I guess I should treat them now the way they treated me. He says, no, uh, don't respond like that. Respond with gentleness and respect. He says, don't, don't fear people's threats. And that, that's what happens when we start fearing people's threats. We start reacting to them and, uh, and maybe acting like they treated us. Peter says, don't do that. Just set apart Christ as Lord. Show them by setting apart Christ as Lord that you're not playing their games. They may slander you. They may say things against you. But, um, but with Christ as your Lord, he's your defender. He's your redeemer. So you don't need to play their games. You don't need to react in kind. And then he says something interesting. He says, when they ask you the reason that you're acting like this, the, that when they ask you the reason for the hope that you have, be prepared to give an answer to them. Now, isn't that interesting? Verse 15, be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. But, he says, and he says this again, do this with gentleness and respect. So this is, this is the idea behind this sermon series. Be prepared to give a reason uh, for the hope that you have within you. The Greek word in the, uh, in the Greek, Peter wrote in Greek this letter. He says, be prepared to give an answer. The word for answer in the Greek is the word apologia. Uh, and the, it sounds like our word apology. Apo and that's actually where we get our word apology. It's from this Greek word apologia. Um, and it's actually where we get the, uh, the other word apologetics. I don't know if anybody's ever heard this term apologetics. 
uh, there's a whole big branch of, of teaching called apologetics. And the, the word means give a def, uh, to give a defense of something, to give kind of a reasoned argument for something, usually a belief or something. So when you're given a, an apology for something, or when you look at apologetics, you're looking at uh, giving a defense for the reason you believe a certain thing, the reason you hold a certain thing. And it comes from this Greek word, apologia. Give, be prepared to give an apologia to anyone who asks you for the reason of the hope you have within you. The field of apologetics, if apologetics is a new word to you, uh, it's, um, I've kind of opened up a whole new world then for you because there's a vast field of apologetics. Uh, you can go to college and get a degree in apologetics. You can get like a doctorate in apologetics if you go to uh, the right college. And so it's a big, it's a vast field and um, just keep that in mind as we sit here for the next 20 minutes or so that <laughs> this is a huge field. We've only got about 20 minutes to talk about it. So we're going to kind of skim the surface a little bit. We're going to kind of look at the tip of an iceberg. But if apologetics is something you're interested in, if, you know, re knowing the reasons for belief is something you're interested in, then you're going to want to look up this, this field of apologetics. Well, why do we need this? Why do we need to give a defense? Why do we need apologetics? Uh, well, first of all, Peter just says you, you need to have a reason when people ask you uh, for the hope that you have within you. And the other, so that's one reason, is for others when they ask us. And I think another, the, the biggest reason for me is um, having reasoned answers, having reasonable answers, reasonable defenses helps us with our own doubts. Uh, many of us don't have uh, confidence in our beliefs, confidence in what we believe. Maybe we, we believe in God, but we don't really know why, and we're kind of shaky on it. And, it. and it keeps us from sharing it with others. It keeps us really me even from having a stronger relationship with God just because we got these, these nagging doubts. Um, the good news about Christianity is it's, it's a religion that you can have confidence in. It's not one of these things where people talk about the, the blind leaps of faith and you just have to trust and yeah, all the evidence is stacked against it. Christianity is totally the opposite. And the more you study it, the more you dig into it, the more you find that all the, the reasons we have for believing, all the evidence for Jesus, all the evidence for God, all the evidence for the claims that the Bible makes. And so it's, it's not one of these things we need to be uh, scared of. We don't need to be scared and saying, well, I... I you know, maybe there isn't any reasons. I just want to believe what I believe. Uh, you can be confident knowing that uh, Christianity is something that has a basis in truth and a basis in fact and history. And uh, this, this idea of apologetics, it really talks about giving answers to these questions and the, the reasons for the belief that we have. It's really like reasons for believing in God. So you can have a relationship with God and still kind of not know why you really have this relationship. And I think that's totally fine. But to really get to the next level, you gotta, you gotta ask that tough question, why? You know what, at the end of the day, why do I believe what I believe? Some people don't like this idea of apologetics or giving reasons uh, or giving answers. I remember I took some preaching classes and in the preaching classes, they, I think all of them said, don't take the time in your sermon to do apologetics, is what they said. Don't, don't take your time to argue out these, these arguments and these reasons for believing, which is, I, I ignored them all, apparently, because we're doing a whole series on it. Uh, but they said, don't do that. And I always thought this was interesting. I wonder why. why. Why do they say, don't have these arguments in a sermon? And there's a couple reasons why you're not supposed to do it. One is that it can be confusing. Sometimes the arguments are philosophical. Sometimes they're technical. And you lose a lot of people really fast if that's all you're doing is giving statistics and percentages and all these things in history. People don't like that. People fall asleep. So that's, why, that's one of the reasons why they say that. And one of the more important reasons why they say it is um, when you, well, how, how should I put this? Just believing that God exists doesn't really do anything. If you, if you argued someone into believing that God exists and they finally got to the point to say, yeah, I guess, okay, I, you're right, God exists somewhere, they, nothing has really changed for them eternally. Nothing has really changed in their heart or in their soul. Uh, believing in, when you say you believe in God, you don't, it's not, the idea isn't that you believe that God exists. The idea is that you have a relationship with him. It, when you, to the, the real transforming thing is to have a relationship with God. To believe in, in, in God is to say that you trust in him. You put your trust in him. To believe, and it's really not just God. We're not just God believers here. We're Christians. It's a very specific idea of God we're talking about. We're talking about 
uh, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth who revealed this God to us. And so that's another reason why they say to stay away from this stuff is because um, just believing that a God somewhere out there exists doesn't really do anything. That's not really the important part. And, and so for all these reasons, they say to stay away from it. But at the same time, although all those things are true, it's difficult to have a relationship with God, to have a relationship with Jesus, and have nagging doubts. That's, that's a difficult thing to do. Maybe some of you or some of us want to have a relationship, but with all these nagging doubts in our head, we think maybe, well, yeah, but I'm not sure about the Bible, but I'm not sure about Jesus, and miracles seem kind of silly, and I don't even know if God's out there anyway. Well, it's hard to have a relationship with all these things going on in your head. So what apologetics does is helps you silence those doubts. And so I think there's, a, there's definitely a place for it, and, um, and that's why I'm, I'm preaching on this. Um, when I first surrendered my life to God, um, I was in my 20s. I think I've shared this story uh, numerous times. And afterwards, after I had done this, I went through years of, and I still do have doubts, but I went through years of, of really pretty severe doubts. You know, I know I gave my life to God, and I, and I felt in my spirit it was the right thing to do, but I kept, I, th I feel like since I battled with atheism earlier in my life, those voices still kept whispering to me. He's not even real. He's not even there anyway. You're praying. Nobody's listening. All this stuff. And for years, I battled with all these things. And so it didn't, it didn't change right away, right when I had a relationship with God. It seems uh, weird to say. And I remember a after a couple years just saying to myself, well, you know, yeah, I okay, I can't prove that God exists. I really like to, but um, you just have to believe. And that was kind of my answer to it. And I remember talking to somebody about this. It was another Christian. He says, sure, you can prove God exists. There's a whole bunch of proofs that God exists. There's a whole bunch of evidence and arguments. And I said, really? I, I, didn't, I didn't know this. I just thought you couldn't do it. He goes, no, you can do it. I can do it 20 different ways. And, uh, and I thought that was so fascinating. And I, that started kind of a journey for me, uh, reading books and reading philosophers and reading history and getting, to, I wanted to know as much as I possibly could. It was a very exciting journey. And I found out you know what? There's a ton of evidence that God exists. There's a ton of evidence. There's a ton of reasons to believe that God exists. And that helped my relationship so much, uh, not because now I believed in him, because I did believe in him before. I just, I just had all those doubts. And so if, uh, if you do have those intellectual barriers, I encourage you to study uh, and find out about it. I'm, I'm very confident, unless you uh, you know, follow very antagonistic people or maybe, you know, hard-nosed atheists and look for them for all your answers, uh, you're going to find that there's a ton of answers. There's a ton of reasons to believe uh, what we believe. The strange part is about uh, argumentation for God, about giving reasons to believe, is that it seems to be very, though, it, though it's helpful for us, or like I say, maybe believers, it seems to be very unhelpful for converting others. And I don't know why exactly this is. Um, when I started getting excited about this and, and learning about apologetics and finding all these reasons to believe and all these evidences for God, I would share these things with others because I was excited about it. And I found that it, it mostly, it, it, didn't, it didn't work out as, as, I wasn't, nobody else was excited as I seemed to be about it. Uh, people who didn't already believe. Uh, they just seemed, it seemed to kind of like water off a duck's back, just rolled right off their back. And I think the reason is uh, exactly what I just said. It's, it's not enough that someone believes that God exists. The relationship has to be there. And that takes a surrendering of spirit. And it's hard to argue someone into doing that. It really takes, uh, really, a, it takes a work of God to do that. With that being said, we're going to talk about some arguments for God's ex existence. Uh, and that, uh, another thing about apologetics, about the reasons to believe, some of these are more convincing than others for different people. It just depends on who you are. So we're going to look at a, a few different arguments for God's existence, a few different reasons to believe in God. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus specifically, and the week after, we're going to talk about the Bible. But we're going to look at God this week. And like I said, we only have time to touch on a few of these. And just remember that you can get a PhD in this stuff if you want, so keep that in mind. Uh, so we're going to look at a couple different categories people have uh, used to argue for the existence of God. One of the first reasons uh, to believe, one of the first uh, reasons for that, that belief in God is a rational thing is, uh, and, and it seem, may seem ironic to you, but uh, scientific reasons, scientifically. The more that scientists discover about the universe, the more we discover about just our world and life and the stars, the more, the more we discover about anything, the more we realize how amazingly complex 
and really awe-inspiring and beautiful the universe is. And it, it always surprises me that, that, to hear that Christians are somehow against uh, science or against scientists because um, really the more that we discover about it, the more, the more amazing God seems, at least to, to my heart. So I'm, I'm, I get very excited. I'm a nerd, so I get excited about science anyway. But um, the more we look at all this stuff, and scientists realize this too, the more you just, the, it, the evidence piles up on itself that there's something behind all this. There's some kind of, there's some kind of mind or organizing principle or, or a person behind this whole thing. I'd like you to take a, a, quick, at this, a quick look at this video. What's called the, the fine-tuning of the universe is what people call it. As we discover in the universe, we discover everything seems to be fine-tuned for everything to exist. So take a look at this. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life-permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body, or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant. A change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. Or another example of fine tuning. If the mass and energy of the early universe were not evenly distributed to an incomprehensible precision of one part in 10 to the 10 to the 123rd, the universe would be hostile to life of any kind. The fact is, our universe permits physical, interactive life only because these and many other numbers have been independently and exquisitely balanced on a razor's edge. A common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect monkeyed with physics and that there are no blind forces worth speaking about in nature. The numbers one calculates from the facts seem to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. There is for me powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe. The impression of design is overwhelming. That's pretty amazing stuff, isn't it? Those two quotes at the end were from, uh, well, Fred Hoyle and Paul Davies are two. Well, I don't know if you heard the Hoyle You've heard these names before, maybe if you're a geek like me. But these, here's our scientists looking at these numbers and saying, something is behind this whole thing. When you, when you just add up all these numbers, it, like the one guy said, it seems to me incomprehensible. There's some kind of, one of them said, there's some kind of mind that has monkeyed with physics uh, to make it all work. Um, if, and, and that's the amazing thing. If one of these numbers is off, just a hair, just, just a, a stretch, and remember there's a ton of these. If you imagine like a uh, hundred different dials that are all tuned into this one precise number, and if one of them was off just a little bit, we, nothing would exist. Um, the evidence seems to think something must have caused this. Something must have set this in motion. Um, some kind of int intelligent 
powerful. Uh, imagine who must have done this? <laughs> who has the power to do this? Uh, this person must be intelligent. They must be very powerful. They must be outside of the universe, because remember, this is to, to have the universe at all. And they must be immaterial. They, they must not be made of matter or anything. So once you start laying out what this person... I get geeked out about science, so I can keep talking about this forever. So I, I, I don't want to... I don't want to bore you, but um, you you think back in your elementary school days or middle school or high school, whenever they said this, and the and matter is made up of these things, particles, there's electrons, there's protons, neutrons. If I lost everybody already, just take a nap. Uh, you know, I'll wake you up at the end. So every single atom in the universe is held together by this, you know, they say protons are positive, electrons are negative. And so that, that force, the electromagnetic force, holds all the atoms together. And then you look and you discover more and you find out inside this, the nucleus of every atom is all these protons. And so you say, well, wait a second. When you put two positive ends of a magnet together, they repel each other. You know, you've got to have a positive and a negative. That's how the electron spins around. How do you get all these positive charges, all these positive protons, to stick together inside the nucleus? And scientists say, well, I don't know, but it does. And so we call that force the, the strong nuclear force. And it's like, okay, you put a name to it, but think of how amazing this whole thing is. You know, just putting a name to something doesn't explain it away. And I think that's, we, we get confused about stuff like that. I sometimes will picture, w w picture our universe as a, as a big box, and we're inside this box, and we're studying inside the box. Well, just let's say we've studied every single thing we can about this box. We've learned every single thing there is to know. We know about all the laws. We know about all the particles. We know where they're going, and we know where, where they are. Um, would that mean that the box is all that exists? If there was somebody sitting in a box here, and they said, the box is all that exists, you would say... No, I mean, yeah, that's great. You know a lot about the box, but that doesn't mean that's all that exists. Where'd the box come from? Uh, and so anyway, uh, the, when you look at the, the evidence for this, even scientifically, what's called the, you look at the fine-tuning of things and even just how things are held together, um, the conclusion seems to be pretty obvious that something is holding these things together. And the, philosopher, uh, the philosophers have called this the unmoved mover. There, there needs to be something that doesn't move that is moving everything else. And it's not another thing in the world, and this is what we need to remember too, that God isn't something else in the world. I think this is what confuses a lot of unbelievers and believers alike, that we keep looking for God somewhere. There was a famous philosopher, uh, Bertrand Russell, uh, earlier in the 20th century. He says, I don't believe in God because I don't, I don't see him anywhere. He says, I, don't, I also don't believe that there's a teacup floating out in space by Jupiter. I think that was his example. And he says, if I, I, you know, I don't see any evidence for it, and so I don't believe in it. But God isn't something in the universe. God isn't like, oh, we need to look out and we need to find him somewhere. Uh, God's the thing that's holding the whole thing together. That's what we're talking about when we talk about God. Not something in the universe that we can look at and find, but the thing holding the whole thing together. So we've got to make sure we're talking about the right thing here. We're talking about God. Um, so that's one example. And that's, there's actually a couple arguments in there, but they, they stem from the same thing. They stem from creation or fine-tuning. Another argument that some people use for the existence of God is uh, what's called a moral argument. That we see all these laws in the universe and we see matter following, you know, electromagnetism or the strong nuclear force or the weak nuclear force. We also find inside ourselves certain laws, certain moral laws. And we have to ask, where do these laws come from? Uh, Everybody knows, no matter what, some cul different cultures around the world have different little rules that they follow themselves by, but everybody will agree on things like you, you shouldn't torture kids. Everybody knows, unless you've got something wrong in your brain, that that's just a general, that's wrong. Um, and everybody kind of knows it pretty strongly in themselves. Well, where did this law come from? And people say somebody had to write this law. And without God, we wouldn't be able to say things like that. Without some kind of um, objective moral reason, we wouldn't be able to say things like, hey, you shouldn't torture kids. You might get, be able to give like a reason for it, but you can't explain the law that's built into every single person. 
And what's strange is, though, we look out in the universe and we see matter following, all, matter following laws and atoms are following laws and electrons are doing it. But when we see this law in our own life, I think one of the interesting things is we have the choice to not follow the law that we have, in, that we see inside of us. So everything is forced to follow these laws, but we seem to have a choice. But again, the question, where did, these, where did that law come from? So some people argue from the, the moral law. Some people will argue for the existence of God based on, uh, it's called the argument from desire. That we have desires for things because something can satisfy those desires. So when a baby is born, a baby will cry for milk or food or whatever. And the reason it cries for milk is because there is, it was built for milk. It, that's, it knows what it needs and there's something that can satisfy that. Um, we get thirsty because there's something called water that can satisfy that thirst. If, we're, if there wasn't water, we wouldn't be thirsty for water. We would be thirsty for something else. But that's why we have these desires, because we're, we're built for something that can satisfy it. Well, every one of us has a built-in desire for a relationship with God. If you go, again, to any culture that, is, that has ever existed, you'll find some kind of religion within that culture. Uh, even if they've never heard of Jesus or anything like that, and that's a whole other question we'll talk about, but you're going to find some kind of belief there, some kind of belief in a higher power, some kind of belief that something's out there, that there's a, a desire for a relationship. So if we see in our lives that every single desire that we have has something that satisfies that desire, then it stands to reason that our desire for God must be filled by something. Well, what is that thing? Well, it's, it's God. Like somebody said, we, we all have a God-shaped hole that we're built with. And the most probable explanation for this is, well, there's something that satisfies that desire. Why is it that we, we have satisfaction for all the other desires that we have, and yet there's this one glaring one we think, there's, there's nothing on earth that can satisfy this. Well, the most probable explanation is we weren't built for this world. There's something outside this world that is supposed to satisfy us. Now, that's a few, I touched on a few uh, of the arguments. Like I said, there's many more arguments like this, and some you may find more convincing than others, and, and some I do maybe a bad job of arguing more than others. Uh, but the question I want to ask ourselves is, again, why do, why do we believe what we believe? Um, why do you believe what you believe? For many of us, and this is completely 100% fine, by the way, it's just an inward feeling that we have. It's just a feeling that I just know God's there and I know I have a relationship with him. And, and that's totally fine. Feeling God's love is, that's really the, the main reason we do believe in God is because we just sense him. Most people come to God not out of, uh, you know, a string of arguments and at the end of the hundredth argument they come to believe in God. Most people, it's, you know, like a crazy thing. They, they sense a love, they sense a presence. You, you look out and you see a sunset and you just think, wow. You, you feel grateful. You want to thank someone. And you think, there's got to be someone I can thank for this. I just feel it in my, in my soul. And that's a, that's a perfectly valid reason for believing. If someone asks you why you believe, that's a perfectly valid answer. Uh, one of the very first Christian martyrs, uh, that guy named Polycarp, this is right when Christianity was first getting started. Uh, this guy, Polycarp, uh, had some writings. He actually knew the Apostle John. He was the Apostle John's student. And uh, he had some writings, and they ended up um, killing him. He was martyred for his faith. And when they, they brought him up, and they were going to burn him at the stake, and uh, the Romans said, all you need to do to stop us from burning you at the stake is just denounce God. Stop saying that Jesus is Lord. And his response was, 86 years I have served Jesus, and he has done me no wrong. How can I now blaspheme my king and my savior? So just Polycarp, he just, and they, and, they, and they took away his life. But his reason for believing is, I've, I've, ha I've known this guy for 86 years. He has never served me wrong as long as I've been walking with him. How can I blaspheme him now? That's a great reason for believing in God. But, but have, you need to, like Peter says, be prepared to give a reason when people ask. That's why I'm challenging us with this, to, with this today. But that inner reason, that inner voice, that's, the, that's what we call the testimony of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit in us just testifying. I just, I just know within my heart. And that may be convincing for us, uh, but it's not so convincing for others. 
if, uh, if someone, maybe an atheist, asks you, why do you believe? And you just say, well, I just know in my heart that it's true. You know, your typical atheist is going to say, you know, that's not, that's not convincing. So what do we say to others? And that's, that's another thing I want to challenge us for, uh, to. Ultimately, the, like I said, the argumentation doesn't seem to be even a good way of doing it. The ultimate thing we need to do, and this I want to close with this, is point people to Jesus. That's really what we really need to do because Jesus is the one who transforms people. When people see Jesus, get a vision of him, get a, a sense of him, when they see him at work in others, that's what changes people's heart. Um, remember, like Peter said even, to respond with gentleness and respect. So yes, it's important to give a reason, but it's equally important the, how you're saying that reason. Respond with gentleness and respect. But your best argument is to point someone to Jesus. Honestly, our best argument is a changed life. That really is what it is. That, that is the most convincing thing, I think, to others. I was, uh, during this period of my life, um, I had a friend who was going to U of M as a philosophy major, and we're arguing philosophy is one of these other nerdy things that I like to nerd out about. And we're arguing back and forth about philosophy the whole night. We're at a friend's wedding, and, uh, and he's getting more and more drunk, and it's getting more and more ridiculous. But I'm still arguing this whole night and uh, not getting anywhere. I got absolutely nowhere. He's still an unbeliever, unfortunately. But um, earlier in the night, he had talked about how disappointed he was because his phone, uh, or not his phone, this is back when they had cameras, his camera ran out of batteries. And... Um, and unbeknownst to me, my wife, Crystal, had gone out and bought some batteries and came back to the wedding. So this whole time, I'm, I'm arguing with this guy, trying to argue, argue, argue. And here Crystal comes and says, hey, I, I bought some batteries for your camera. That, and he had tears in his eye. He's like, I don't understand why you would do that. I, he goes, I could have left, but I wanted to stay. But you left for me. You did that for me. And that act did more than all my <laughs> arguing that night. Uh, that's the best argument we can give is chain life. And I don't know if you saw this. This, is, this was so powerful. Um, you've heard in the news, maybe or not, this, the Facebook killer. I don't want to, I know the kids are coming back in. Um, this guy had filmed himself. He just killed some random person on the street. I don't know if you'd heard this. And on CNN, they, they brought in this, the man who was killed. Eventually, the Facebook killer took his own life, unfortunately. But it, they brought in the family of the man who was killed. I don't know if you saw this on CNN. I couldn't get the video of it, but I transcribed it because I thought it was so cool. Anderson Cooper is sitting there on CNN, and they have the family of the man who was killed, and they said uh, to the family, what would you like to say, what would you like to tell us about your father? What, what should we know about him? And the fam one of the daughters, uh, they had, there was two daughters and a son there. He said, my father taught us about God. He taught us how to fear God and how to love God and how to forgive. And I want you to know that each one of us forgives the killer. And Anderson Cooper, he goes, wait, what, you do? You forgive him? And they said, yes, we do. In fact, we want to wrap our arms around this man. She says, I honestly can say right now that I hold no animosity against this man in my heart. I know that he has a sickness, and whatever evil overtook him that caused him to do this to my dad, that's not him. I promise you, and then another daughter speaks up, I promise you that I could, I could not love and forgive this man if I didn't know God. Even I, even, uh, I could not forgive him if I didn't know God as my God and Savior. I couldn't forgive him without Jesus. But with God, I have no animosity in my heart toward him. Actually, I feel sadness in my heart for him. Anderson Cooper says, how can you be thinking of him during this time, during your grief? And she said, our parents didn't just talk about God and forgiveness, they lived it. We watched our forgot father forgive others, and we know that if he were here, my dad would want us to forgive him. Isn't that amazing? That's, a, well, that's an amazing argument for God, is just that, that changed life, living out that forgiveness. How in the world is anybody going to be able to explain away why a person would say they forgive and want to wrap their arms about, uh, to, around the man who took their own father's life. He said, it, and she says, it wouldn't be possible if I didn't know Jesus as my savior.